Okay, now we're back and we uh, have all this space over here to work with. And so let's now uh, look at an example of a profit maximizing firm. Okay, so here, um, let's, uh, let's start right off, actually, by drawing a kind of Econ 1 diagram here. Um, and that's going to be, let's see, I think we can probably put that here. And let's say here. So this is going to be the quantity of output, the number of units produced, and this is going to be dollar amount. So we're going to have the price over here. We'll have a cost function with this as the axis. And so let's draw in the consumer's, uh, sorry, the, the demand function for the firm's product. So it's the demand, the, the demand that the firm faces for its product, the demand uh, in the marketplace for this first product. And so I'm going to draw that as just a straight line demand curve. Now, there's nothing in what we're doing that requires it to be a straight line. It's just a little more convenient when we look at profit maximization and marginal revenue and so on. But that's not, it's not required. So this then is um, the quantity that the firm can sell is some function G, let's say, of the price that it charges and some parameters. So the price that the firm charges is something it can choose. So it's a decision variable. And the parameters are going to be things that are outside the firm's control. So let's just take a couple of possible parameters. It could be lots of them. But let's take, for example, uh, let's say disposable income uh, in the economy of consumers or disposable income in the uh, local market where the firm operates. And let's just use capital I then for disposable income, uh, again, which the firm obviously has no control over. And let's take a second parameter, which is the price that, let's say, a rival firm is charging. And of course, if there were several rival firms, I could have several prices, uh, so de several different parameters for those. But let's just say there's one rival firm, and I'll use an R for the rival firm's price here. So we have two parameters and one decision variable. And now, uh, this is, a, the I think, the more intuitive way to describe this, but it's going to be more familiar to us, as we'll see in, as we go along. It's actually going to be more familiar if I, instead of having the quantity that the firm sells be a function of the price it charges, to reverse that and say that as a function of the quantity that it wants to sell, What's the price that it can obtain? Now, that is admittedly less intuitive, but that is the way this is done in, for example, Econ 1, your first course. So let's actually take this out, and let's take this out and just reverse them. It's not the same function P, of course, but I'm sorry, it's not the same function G, but uh, I'm going to use the same letter for the, the function where I have uh, the price that the firm can obtain for its product is a function of the amount that it wants to sell. And so, of course, the picture of the demand curve that it faces, the demand curve for its product, is going to be the same diagram, same picture, uh, if I reverse these. In fact, this is just, if you like, the inverse function of the function that I had up there the first time. And so, this just tells me that for any, uh, for any quantity that I want to sell, what's the price I can obtain? When I did it the first time, for any price that I might want to charge, what's the quantity I can sell? And so, uh, to begin with, let's just, let's just put that diagram down and then we'll add to the diagram as we go along. So, what is the firm's problem? The firm's problem, the, ma the profit maximization problem, uh, which we will call, uh, I'll call it just Pi Max to give it a name, profit maximization. That's to maximize um, 
And actually, I think I'm going to leave a little more space here, so I'm actually going to take this off and rewrite the same thing uh, a little lower because I think I'm going to need a little more space down here in this diagram. So let's say uh, we'll call this pi max, and the problem is going to be to maximize the firm's profit. The firm's profit depends on the decision that it takes, the Q, the way we've modeled it, the Q is the decision variable, and the profit is also going to depend on these two parameters. Now I could model, I could write the problem down as the decision variables are both Q and P, and then say that this is a constraint, that the P and the Q are going to have to be related. The firm can choose a P and a Q only subject to this constraint here, and that would be a perfectly good way to write the problem too, but I'm not going to do it that way just because I think this is more familiar, uh, more straightforward. So the firm is going to maximize its profit, and of course the decision variable here is just the Q, and that's going to be chosen from amongst all the possible quantities in R+, plus, because the firm isn't going to be able to choose a negative quantity, but can choose any non-negative quantity. And here, in contrast to the first problem, there aren't any constraints. Now, I mentioned that I could have formulated the problem with an extra decision variable, the P, and then added this as a constraint. That would work too. In fact, that's a good exercise to reformulate the problem in that way and see that everything comes out the same. But here, we're going to just have this. And so, let's even write in here with no constraints. So there's no constraints, but of course, there still are parameters. So let's again, let's identify what in our problem here, what parts of our problem here, play the roles of various, the various items in our general problem. And obviously, this is the decision variable that's playing the role of x. R plus is playing the role of capital X. So we have a one variable, a one dimensional problem. This again is x. I and R are playing the role of theta. And uh, so let's just say, as we did before here, theta equals, it's a two-dimensional vector, and that's got to be in R. The disposable income and the rival's price are going to be things that are non-negative, so it's going to be in R2+, plus, and so that's playing the role of uppercase theta, the set of possible parameter values. Obviously, the m here is 2, and the n here is 1. So that's our problem. That's the standard maximization problem. You probably don't write it that way in Econ 1, your Principles of Economics course, but you certainly see this problem there. And so, now let's, uh, let's note, before we go to the solution function, the value function, let's note that pi of q, i, and r is actually, profit is, of course, always just revenue minus cost. So the profit here is going to be revenue, and revenue is going to be the price that the firm obtains, g, of Q, I, and R times Q. So when the firm chooses a quantity, that quantity, of course, is going to be multiplied by the price that the firm obtains to get the revenue. And then over here, we have minus the cost, which depends only on Q. I'm going to come back and say a little bit about that cost function just a little bit in a moment. And so that would be our profit function. It's just revenue minus cost. Maybe even point out here that, um, maybe even point out that this is revenue as a function of Q, I, and R. So it's revenue minus cost. I emphasize that because that's an important thing. It's such a simple thing. Uh, but it is something that people forget a lot of the time, that profit is nothing but revenue 
minus cost. And they're somewhat separable. We can analyze revenue separate from cost, and we can analyze cost separate from revenue. And that's an important fact, actually, in doing consulting. Consulting for firms is that to, to emphasize to them that you can separate revenue and pricing from cost and analyze them and make decisions about them separately and then, of course, bring them together. And, of course, bringing them together is what we're doing when we maximize the profit involving both revenue and cost. So let's put in here our solution function is going to be to give us the optimal level of our decision variable, Q, and that's going to be a function of the parameters, I and R. And uh, let's just point out that that would be, that means that Q hat is a function from R to plus the parameter space into R plus the decision variable or decision space, which is one dimensional. And of course, it is the firm's, um, this tells us the uh, firm's supply uh, function as a function of the parameters, not of prices, but of the parameters. It tells us what the firm will do in response to the environment that it finds itself in. Oh, so I should emphasize, uh, this is something I should have said uh, at the outset here. It's kind of important. This obviously is a firm that is not a, what we call a price-taking firm. This is a firm that has some market power, some pricing power. So it's not the case that this firm faces a market price, like a wheat farmer, let's say, faces the market price for wheat over which he has no control. This is not that situation. This is more a situation where the firm might have some competition, one or more rivals, but the firm knows that it can raise or lower the price. It can raise the price without losing all of its sales. It'll move along the, dem the demand curve that it faces, and it could lower the price, and it's not going to just take over the entire market if it lowers the price, but it will increase its sales if it lowers its price. So when I said this was a kind of a supply function, that's a little misleading because usually we think the supply function is the quantity as it depends on the exogenous price that the firm takes as given. Here, that's not the case. This firm is not taking price as given, but choosing price as a result of the quantity it chooses. And again, remember I said we could have done the problem in the more intuitive way of having price in here and quantity here. It's more intuitive, but it's not actually is familiar as doing things this way, which is a little odd about economics, but that's just the way we've done economics. And there's kind of a reason for that, and that's because the Q enters in the cost function. And if I tried to make the P the decision variable, this would be a little more complicated, as I'll mention in just, again in just a moment. So um, we have our solution function. And remember, the solution com function comes from the first order, from solving the first order conditions, the equations. Well, here, what are the first order conditions? So here, let's just write, let me write this in a little different color here. Well, you can use this color here. So let's just say that this comes from the first order conditions. And here, the first order condition is that the derivative of pi with respect to q be zero. So let's just write pi prime of q. And here I'm writing pi prime rather than the partial derivatives because, uh, I mean, I could write the partial derivative because we have these other variables, these parameters, but the, the firm can't choose those anyway. So the firm has a one-dimensional choice, so I'm just writing pi prime as the derivative here. And this has got to be zero. And that is the derivative of the revenue function minus the derivative of the cost function is zero, which means marginal revenue equals marginal cost. So we could rewrite this as marginal revenue as a function of Q, I, and R has to be equal to marginal cost, which depends only on Q. Okay, now I could, 
I said I was going to come back and say a little about the cost function. I could model the firm's problem as not only choosing the quantity of output, but choosing the amounts of the inputs. And so the amounts of the inputs would enter into the cost function. That would be additional decision variables. Those decision variables would enter over here and not over here. And maybe the market prices of the inputs would be in here too. And so that would make the problem a lot bigger problem, more variables, more parameters, but we could do the same things. And that would be true down here too. We'd have a marginal cost that would depend on the amount of output through the inputs that would be used. Now you'll notice in the lecture notes for the solution function and the value function, you'll notice that a third example there is exactly that example of looking at the cost function. So in that, so this is a little bit of an aside here. There, the uh, objective function is the cost function that the firm wants to minimize to produce some specified level of output Q. And it minimizes its cost function by choosing input amounts, those would be the decision variables, choosing input am amounts that minimize the expenditure or cost to get a given level of output. And that's where this cost function actually comes from. So you can see in the lecture notes this additional example of cost minimization to get a particular uh, target level of output. And that's, that's how we generate this cost function. Those, this and that cost minimization, expenditure minimization to get the cost function, those again, much like the utility maximization problem, are going to be central problems in your first course in microeconomic theory in, uh, in the program in the uh, fall semester. Okay, back to our problem here. Uh, let's now write in the value function. for this firm's problem. Just coming back to our aside for a moment, in the problem of minimizing cost, the value function, which tells us the value of the objective function, the value function is the cost function, as you'll see in that problem in the lecture notes. For, so for the cost minimization problem in this framework, the value function is very much the thing we're interested in because it tells us what the value of the cost the objective function is uh, at our optimal choice. Here, the value function is going to be, we write it, V as a function of the parameters, and that is going, to, of course, to be the profit at the optimal objective, sorry, the optimal decision. The optimal decision is a function of I and R, and here, Unlike the utility maximization problem, we actually have parameters entering the objective function, so they have to enter in the objective function here too. I'll use again a semicolon to emphasize the separation of the decision variables from the parameters. So this would be I and R, and let's just point out again that this and this are the theta in the problem. Whoa, getting kind of a mess over here. Let's take that off. And so let's just finish by again pointing out that what we are often very interested in in the profit maximization problem is um, how the firm's choice will be affected by changes in the parameters. So if I change the parameters, then let's just say I change disposable income. So increase disposable income, maybe shift this, doesn't have to shift parallel, so I'll make it not necessarily a straight line. And so that if I increase, if there's an increase in disposable income, that might shift things out to here. So here I have um, G of Q, but for different parameter values, a different disposable income, and maybe also even a different price from the rival firm. Maybe the rival firm lowers its price, increasing the amount my firm can sell at any given price. 
So there's a shift outward in this case in the demand curve the firm faces for its product. Um, and that shift ref is what reflects the change in the exogenous um, environment that the firm finds itself in, change in the parameters. And so analytically, that's a diagram, of course, but what I want to know is how to deal with this analytically. Uh, and so that would be, uh, I want to know about the change in Q due to a change in parameters, either the I or the R. Uh, that comes via the implicit function theorem applied to the first order condition equation. So we would apply the implicit function theorem to this equation in Q and the parameters. So we have both the decision variable and the parameters in our equation. And, and uh, neither, and so our decision variable isn't just isolated on the left hand side, giving us a closed form solution for the optimal quantity as a function of the parameters. We have an equation involving the parameters and the decision variable, perhaps on both sides. So I may need to use the implicit function theorem to do this. If I can't work, if I can't, if I can't uh, reconfigure my first order condition as uh, an equation that gives me the optimal quantity as a closed form expression in the parameters, which, and that would be the typical case. And of course, if I want to know how the profit level is affected by changing the parameters, I'm going to have this via the envelope theorem. So this and this are two things that we are going to need to figure out, learn about, and understand uh, going forward, and we're going to do that uh, shortly, uh, in order to be able to work with the solution function and the value function in our typical kind of problem. So let me just finish off here by saying one more thing here, and that is that everything I did here was with a firm with a single product. We didn't say anything about the inputs, there might be lots of different kinds of inputs that go into the firm's cost function. And that's dealt with, as I said, in a separate example in the lecture notes. But here we had just one, a one product firm. Everything we did here, except the picture, except the diagram, everything we did here will work exactly the same way if this is a multi-dimensional problem. So the firm has multiple products. So this could be now in Rn. The firm has n products. Don't have to change anything else here. It may still only be just the two parameters. Down here, this would be, uh, of course, profit depends on this, now on this n vector. Solution function. Now I'm asking about how a particular product's quantity will change uh, for the firm and the firm's decision when a parameter changes. So this, of course, would now become not just, oops, that will stay the same. <laughs> that, let's get that out of there. That's not, uh, the parent, still only two parameters. That's a mistake. Uh, get that out of there. This would become Rn because there's now n decision variables. And I don't actually think I have to change anything else here. But of course, the actual analysis now would involve a lot of partial derivatives. Uh, we would be getting that the first order conditions would be that the marginal revenue, to the extent that we can separate out the costs for the various inputs. So things clearly are going to be a little more complicated here because of this cost function, will, the different products are going to be all intertwined in the cost function. So typically I can't write something as simple as that. Um, but, well, that's not entirely true because I can certainly write the, how the cost, so this should be marginal cost here, would be how does the cost change 
as a function of Q1. So this would be the marginal cost, not the cost of that good, but how the overall cost changes if I change the quantity of good one. Um, and the same for the marginal revenue. That's a little more straightforward uh, because that would just be changing things up here. When we change, um, when we change uh, uh, the amount of the first good. So basically everything goes through pretty much the same way if we have multiple products for the firm, but it's a lot simpler to see, a lot more familiar with the one product firm. Um, and I think that is pretty much everything we want to do here uh, for the solution function and the value function for a generic, general, typical uh, optimization problem or, if you like, decision problem. And uh, there are a couple more examples in the lecture notes, and I'll probably give one or two examples in, uh, in the exercises. So uh, that's it for today. <laughs> See you all next time.